So you get the, those inputs from your typically chief financial officer, financial director, and management. But they have a particular bias. Uh, it's not to suggest they're dishonest or anything of that nature. It's just that automatically, human nature, they have a particular bias as to how the information is presented that suits their own agenda. And it does not necessarily in a sinister way. It can be in an innocent way. But you have to recognise that it exists. The auditor is, your, is a key player in any audit committee, as you know, attends all the meetings, and the audit committee properly run they're looking to make sure that they comply with the standards. Look to the auditor. But what they should do is look to the auditor for support, not for the guidance. And in many of the audit committees uh, to which I've been exposed, they are led by the auditor. The auditor says, oh, this is the way you do it, and he pulls the audit committee along by the nose, as it were, and that's they all accept. But really, your role is to just go and so to challenge the auditor and say, but this isn't so. Just as an example, for those of you that sit on audit committees or see the audit committees, you'll see the standard engagement letter that comes from the big four. Standard engagement letter they give to all the listed clients and probably the same one to the unlisted clients. Uh, audit committees, most of them, simply sign that off. In other words, they authorise management to sign off. Next time you have a look at that letter, Look at it carefully and you'll find there's at least two unlawful uh, statements within those standard engagement letters. Simply unlawful, contrary to uh, the Auditing Profession Act. It's an attempt to limit liability in the standard engagement letter, which is simply unlawful. It's void in terms of the APA. But there it sits and every audit committee just accepts it. And there's another one about, in the standard letter, about where the audit report fits in the context, as if it was regulated by the Companies Act, which it no longer is. As you know, our Companies Act, brackets half-baked as it is, um, no longer has any duties at all for the auditor. You'll recall the old Companies Act had at least 13 duties in one section alone, the old Companies Act, 13 in one section, plus it was peppered here and there with other specific duties, examine the minute book, et cetera, et cetera. All of those are gone. There's not even a duty to report on the financial statements. There's not one duty in the Companies Act for the auditor. There is a requirement for audited financial statements without telling you actually what does that mean. At least the old Act said, report whether they fairly present. Anyway, that's a by the by, but it gives you an indication that you can't have blind reliance on the auditor uh, from an audit committee level to say, well, the auditor is all knowing, well, ergo, it must be right. Your job is to challenge him or her as well. They're not sacrosanct. And you'll get other inputs, uh, actuaries and others, and the same applies to all of them. But they've got to, obviously you must respect the opinion of those that are skilled, but you should have the appropriate healthy scepticism. Just to say, sit back and say, well, it's all very well, it doesn't this make sense. And, and explain it to me, because if I don't understand, well, then something's wrong with you, not with me. <laughs> Say to my students, if they go out there uh, and they don't understand a transaction, they're now working at Conkey or wherever they're working, then there's something wrong with the transaction, not something wrong with them. <laughs> because they should know, they're skilled to know. I just want to touch on some areas of caution, uh, which are really practical issues, so we don't just talk in generalities. And each of these areas I'm going to talk about are live. They actually emanate from real cases with real listed entities before uh, the FRIP. So they don't just exist in some vacuum of what might be a problem in somebody's mind. So let's just have a look at uh, the first area, which is the, the whole area of acquisitions and disposals. If you at the audit committee level, when you're looking for what I've called flashpoints in the slides, really potentially troublesome areas for reporting, acquisitions and disposals is an area that warrants particular attention. And again, I stress don't have blind reliance on the auditor because you've got to sit back, they don't necessarily have all the answers. 
particularly if they come from an environment where it's all on a template basis, where you're not encouraged to think, which is unfortunately uh, a thing that one finds in some of the firms. So let's have a look at the issues in, that are, have arisen, these are all live. Uh, the first one is the date of accounting. And what, we are, what I'm talking about there is for purposes of consolidation or deconsolidation, you sell a subsidiary, buy a subsidiary, or buy a business, sell a business, what's the date at which you stop accounting or start accounting? Now, all of us uh, been out there, either as practitioners or in business, would have seen many agreements, and the agreements always have an effective date, a legally effective date, and that, of course, can be set as anything. There's no problem with an effective date that is six months or nine months before the signature date. That's not backdating in the sinister sense that you need the public protector. That's the backdating which is a fraud. You sign today and you put the date as six months ago. That's fraud. But in, a, in an, an agreement context, where it's signed today and you simply say legally the effective date is nine months ago. And there's no problem with that legally. But what's the accounting uh, in, in that context? So we've encountered uh, at the FRIP uh, entities that bring to account the results of a subsidiary from the legal effective date. So they signed the agreement today, backdated nine months ago, and they bring to account the results from nine months ago. Measure goodwill against the NAV nine months ago, based on the legal effective date. Of course, for accounting, that's entirely wrong. Because we're talking about the date of control, and we need control in an accountant's context. That is real control, not legally effective control. We mean actual control because we're in the real world, not in the ethereal world. So in real life cases, we have seen both on the sales side and on the disposal side where they account for them at dates other than the actual date upon which they assume control. Control is defined meaning in substance and reality, not the legal effective date. So, when we look at those issues, it's always good to be alive to when you should, should start and stop accounting, and what is the guide you can use, apart from the say-so of management. When I say, when did you take control? I say, well, X date. The guide you can use in South Africa is the date when you got the competition authority approval. Why? Because the Competition Act, in South Africa, the way it works, what they call a merger, what we accountants would call a takeover, they call a merger. They say, you can't lawfully implement a merger until you have the approval. I'm talking about for the big transactions. And the way they define it, that, that implementation date would coincide with what we, the accountants, consider as real control. When you have real control, then I can actually implement. So unless you're acting unlawfully, you couldn't really implement before you have that approval. So it's just an, an area to to be aware of, particularly for both acquisitions and disposals. The second issue, just to highlight again, live issues that have actually arisen, is acquisitions where you pay by share issue. So the issues that arise there is whether you should account for this under IFRS 2 or IFRS 3.